Senator McCain, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. First of all, let's go back to the events of Friday and how you experienced them. The news broke here in the United States on a Friday afternoon. What did you feel at the time? And also, you have warned many times in the past of a terrorist attack of this nature, either in Europe or the United States. What you saw, did it seem almost inevitable to you? The way that we have handled uh, the phenomena of ISIS uh, uh, made it almost inevitable. I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry that I was right. And of course, one of the overriding emotions that Americans have because our oldest ally suffered a, a severe blow was prayers, sorrow, sympathy, uh, an outpouring from Americans that I have, frankly, I've never seen for the French people. So, but having said that, um, given the lack of a strategy to defeat ISIS, it was only a matter of time. Mr. Baghdadi was in our prison camp called Camp Bukha in Iraq for four years. Uh, he emerged as a leader. When he left, he said to the Americans, when we released him, he said, I'll see you in New York. There's no doubt what their ambitions are. They don't want to defeat France. They don't want to defeat the United States, but they want to sow terror and thereby motivating and recruiting uh, people to their cause. Success breeds success. For this to happen on such a big scale in Paris, in one of the big European capitals, what did the French security services do wrong? What went wrong for something like this to happen basically on our doorstep? I'm not sure the French security services did wrong. You have a, a flow of people coming back and forth. Uh, you have a, a rather sophisticated operation here. Uh, I, ca I can't put a lot of blame on the security services. What I can put the blame on is the United States of America's lack of leadership that should have seen what this movement is all about. Uh, when we left Iraq, there was no such thing as ISIS. This is the godchild of Al-Qaeda and also godchild of Bashar Assad. And uh, so they, we watched it grow and grow and grow, and now it's got its tentacles throughout the Middle East. And there have been many more warnings of uh, attacks to come in the coming weeks or months. You said yesterday on the Senate floor, we have to listen to their words making reference to the latest video that was released by the Islamic State Organization in which they specifically refer to where we are right now, to Washington, D.C. Are you expecting a next terrorist attack to happen right here? I do not know if there's going to be an attack, but I believe there's a significant threat of an attack. The director of our Central Intelligence Agency just yesterday, yesterday said that there were operations ongoing now, in other words, plans for attacks. The question is, do we, uh, are we able to prevent those attacks? Uh, and the director of the FBI has also said that ISIS poses a, quote, direct threat to the United States of America. I certainly agree with him. Well, since then, since the attacks in Paris on Friday, uh, the French military has significantly stepped up its military operations over Syria with all of those airstrikes on the stronghold uh, of, uh, of Raqqa. Uh, and we've heard that the French military will be working very closely with the U.S. military. And to, they speak of military cooperation. We know that there'll be intelligence sharing, but what exactly does that mean, military cooperation in this case between France and the United States? Well, I would hope it means that we share intelligence, that we even fly uh, raids uh, together, that we have uh, every possible kind of cooperation that we can, and that means sharing intelligence, that means targeting, that means all kinds of ways of us working together. But there is a legitimate question. All these targets that the French hit, which we are so glad of, where were the Americans all this time? Why didn't they hit those targets? We have had such a restrictive policies towards where we strike and where we can't that it's obvious that for over a year it has not done significant damage to ISIS. Well, let's talk about the U.S. policy. Last time we spoke was two years ago. Uh, you spoke of a lack of strategy on behalf of the U.S. president. Now he's being urged to change his strategy. What exactly should the United States do in this? You have repeatedly spoken about, about ground troops. What exactly do you mean? 
Well, exactly, and ground troops is about 10,000 Americans with a coalition of other Arab countries, hopefully maybe NATO countries, maybe even France, that where we could go in on the ground with sufficient air support to take out ISIS. They are not in invincible. They are not unbeatable. But as long as they have this base and this ability, unlike Al Qaeda, then we are they're going to be able to orchestrate threats to the United States of America. The second thing we need to do is a, a, a robust arming, training, and equipping. The only way you can do that is having a no-fly zone, a buffer zone, where also you could relieve the pressure from uh, the refugee problem, so that they would not be barrel bombed by Bashar Assad the great butcher in the history of the Middle East. And French President Francois Hollande uh, declared war, basically. He said that France was at war on that same Friday, that same Friday evening. It does sound a little bit too much almost like a war on terror, though, doesn't it? This is a war on a group that calls it itself Islamic State, isn't really a state, though, doesn't have a clear geographic anchoring. Doesn't it sound a little bit too much like a war that the United States has been waging and that clearly isn't ending at all. I understand President Hollande and the French people's reaction to this. Um, it is a form of warfare, but it's a different kind of warfare. But I think when you kill citizens of a country and commit acts of terror, then you can only describe it as war. But you've got to describe it as the kind of war that it is. And by the way, I have great respect for President Hollande, but I firmly disagree with an alliance with the Russians. The Russians are supporting Bashar Assad, who has barrel bombed and slaughtered a quarter million of his own people. Why do we have this refugee problem? Why were these, these ref, one of these uh, terrorists that attacked Paris that came through Greece as a, quote, refugee? It's because of a failed policy which has allowed this situation in Syria to deteriorate to the point where people just have to leave. And so to, uh, Vladimir Putin's ambitions are very different from ours. He wants to keep Bashar Assad or his stooge in power. He wants to maintain a major role in the Middle East and his port. That is not the ambition of the United States of America, nor should it be the ambition of France. But doesn't it look like inevitably that on the diplomatic front, these countries somehow have to get together? Francois Hollande is coming over to Washington on Tuesday of next week. Only two days after that, he will be in Moscow to meet uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia. Clearly, he wants to build something that he calls a grand coalition, and that would include Vladimir Putin. Are you sure that is not one potential way out of this for everybody to somehow forcibly get along on the diplomatic front. Does, does this ignore the dismemberment of Ukraine? Does this ignore the pressures that are being put on the Baltic countries? Does this ignore uh, all of the uh, policies and actions on the part of Vladimir Putin that are in direct uh, uh, contradiction to everything we stand for and believe in? Are we just going to now say, yeah, go ahead, go ahead in, in Ukraine? And by the way, probably next spring he will be making additional moves in Ukraine. Is that, is that where, there, there's a certain moral standard to watch a country being dismembered and then in another part of the world just because of expediency, you, you, you're now going to cooperate with them and allow them to carry out their ambitions which are dramatically different from ours. Ours is the removal of Bashar Assad. His is to keep Bashar Assad or his stooge in power. ISIS has killed a lot of people. Bashar Assad has killed a quarter of a million of them. He's the one that drove the refugees. So, uh, and, and who's backing Bashar Assad? Vladimir Putin. So without him at the table, uh, as you would like to see the situation to unfold, yeah. where is this political transition? U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said just recently, a transition is just weeks away. Is that even possible? Can you see that? John Kerry has said on numerous occasions, he's convened 50 countries in Geneva. He's convened in Vienna. Must be really nice there. Uh, time after time after time. Uh, this thing is not going to end until 
Bashar Assad has left, and then we can arrange a transition. Then we can arrange a peacekeeping force inside Syria, while we can arrange for uh, the, uh, uh, the civil society to take place, and all of those things in a transition. Will it be easy? No. Will it be a lot better than the status quo? Yes. This Bashar Assad, who is being sponsored by Vladimir Putin is the guy that killed th thousands with chemical weapons. He's a war criminal. Let me get finally sure. your point of view on a backlash that we've seen here in the United States since those attacks in Paris on Friday. That backlash concerns the resettlement of Syrian refugees here in the United States. Dozens of US governors now say that they don't want any more Syrian refugees in their respective states. Isn't this going a little bit too far, too quickly, in your view? Governors have seen evidence that refugees came through Greece, or at least one, and, and was committed these acts of terror. They do not have confidence in, in, in this president. So they are correct in the extent that they have to be convinced that the proper vetting procedures are in place. And by the way, I will say, people who say that we would only take Christians that's not, that's not the Christian faith. Love thy neighbor is our faith. I am a Christian, but I believe that we're all God's children. So I really take strong exception to that. I understand the concern that the governors have. It's the obligation of the president and the administration to show them the proper vetting, vetting will be done to prevent us from seeing the repeat of what happened in Paris. Senator, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us.